listen to your word, um, to listen attentively, and to listen carefully to what you have said. Just allow your word to change us. In Jesus' name. Amen. talking about the better covenant or superior covenant <clears throat> versus the old the old covenant and as we uh, as we begin in chapter 9 uh, the first 10 verses is kind of going back over some of that but we're walking into uh, the superior sanctuary um, the sanctuary the copy that was made here on earth was the tabernacle and then the temple. And I want to stress that because we don't talk about that, that the temple and the and tabernacle was actually a copy. So it wasn't perfect. It was a copy of the true heavenly tabernacle where Jesus is right now today. Uh, we, as Christians, are a citizen of two worlds. We're here on earth, and as Christian, if you are a Christian follower of God, then you are a citizen of the of heaven. And it tells us that in, in Matthew 22, 21, that we are to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And we have to we have had have to learn how to walk by faith in a world that's governed by sight. That's hard, isn't it? Everything about the world, everything about living here in this earthly tent, if you will, is about sight. People want to believe what they see and not believe what they don't see. <clears throat> and if you look at Hebrews 11, uh, I'm just... You don't need to turn there, but you can write it down. Hebrews 11, 24 through 27, it talks about how, how if us as believers are to see the invisible, we have to overcome the pull of the world. The practical man says seeing is believing, but, but the man and women of faith say that believing is seeing. Get that? Believing in sin. So that's got, that's what we have to, to apply to our faith and to enhance our relationship to Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary right now. We've never seen the sanctuary, have we? Yet we are to believe, if we're to believe what the God, Bible tells us, then we realize that God's not worshipped in a temple today. In the tabernacle, God's presence was in the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place, whatever your translation says. And there was a veil. Now that veil wasn't a light, and you've heard me say this before, I, I did some research on it. It was a heavy, thick curtain made out of skins and whatnot, and most, of, most everybody believes that it's somewhere between four and eight inches thick. It was like a wall between the holy place in the most holy place, the holy of holies. And God dwelt in that, his presence was in that place. And no one went in there. So we, if, if we were living in that day, we couldn't come into the presence of God. The only person that could go in there was the high priest on one day out of the year, the day of atonement, and he had to carry blood with him. And if you really, really research it. He had bells on the bottom of his gown. He had a, a rope tied to his foot because if he wasn't completely and totally cleansed of sin and everything just right, he was struck dead. 
And no one could go get him, so they had to pull him out with the rope. And the bells kept telling him that he was moving around doing what he was supposed to be doing. So, um, we need to understand today that God is not worshipped in temples made with hands. Like the tabernacle in the Old Testament. We come here to worship, but this is not God's dwelling place. We need to understand that. I think we get that confused a lot. Where is God's dwelling place today? Right here. And we are worshiping a person in Jesus Christ. We need to understand that. We come together in this building, and it's a good, a good place to come to worship. But this is not God's dwelling place. When Jesus died and ascended to his, the sanctuary in heaven, the Holy Spirit came and everyone who truly believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he comes to dwell in us. We are the temple. So just kind of giving you a, a, a background there. All this was put in place by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The work of Jesus began the new covenant that Martin's been talking about for the last two weeks. The external worship that we see in the Old Testament that was happening in the tabernacle foreshadowed the day of Christ coming and what Christ would do and how he would purify the, the consciences of, of his people and how he would dwell among his people, just like I just described. I used to, and I grew up hearing the church building was God's house. But I have, several years back, I finally understood what I was saying, and that's not a true statement. Um, and I try not to say that, but you hear people say it. I've said it in the past, but this is not God's dwelling place. This is a place we come to worship God. This is a place that uh, we set aside so that we have a nice place to come and to worship Him. But God's dwelling place is in, in the hearts of every believer. Hopefully, hopefully that uh, makes sense to you. you know, we as humans want to, want to trust in the things we see and we want to have eyes that see things, touch things with our hands. So back to where this letter was being written to, uh, it was written to these people that were wanting to go back into this Old, Old Testament tabernacle style of slaughter and blood and all that. We, we, we don't have an understanding of just how uh, it would probably just be horrific to some people today as to what went on in the temple sacrifices. But God said that no sin could be taken care of without the shedding of blood. And in the Old Testament, before Christ came, the only thing they had was the animal sacrifices. And they had to be perfect. They had to be without blemish. They had to be of a certain gender for certain types of sacrifices and they had to be done in a certain way most of them they took them and they slit their throats and bled them i know that's gory but i think we need to understand just how 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 it was they would catch the blood in, in buckets or basins and then they would sprinkle it on the altars and sometimes on themselves, uh, depending on the type of sacrifice. This happened every day in the outer court or the holy place. And then <clears throat> the once a year atonement, and we'll talk a little more about that, was a different type of sacrifice. But that's one of the things. This was a hands-on thing. And that's 
what these Hellenistic Jews were wanting to go back to. Something they could see, they could smell, they could feel it. And everything about all the senses that we had. They didn't have to believe on anything that they couldn't see. That's quite a bit different than what we have right now here today, isn't it? There was fire going on the altar. There was fat sacrifices. There was entrails being burned. There was things being washed ceremonially, the, the entrails and all that. It sounds like uh, a butcher shop, doesn't it? We need to understand just how how that was. We, we get away from that today. We're in our little... I don't know, nice, neat, clean areas and, and all that. But that's what went on in the Old Testament sacrifices. And that's just a little bit. I <laughs> look it up sometime. I, I looked up just, just one thing <clears throat> about the sacrifice. When Solomon's temple was built and they uh, wanted to uh, ordain it for God's ministry, they sacrificed 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 head of sheep in two weeks' time. That was just that one thing to, to consecrate the temple that Solomon had built. Think about that. I mean, we think 500 head of cattle in one spot a lot. They had 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 head of sheep. And I don't know if they had any guns or not, but that's what, just looking up real quick, just saw. Just imagine all the blood being shed on, on that day, or on those days, just to consecrate the temple to be fit for God's presence to dwell in. But we're going to look at the first 10 verses this week. Let's read those first 10. It says, Now the first covenant also had regulations for ministry and an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was set up, and in the first room, which is called the holy place, were the lampstand, the table, and presentation loaves. Behind the second curtain, the tabernacle was called the most holy place, or some translation will say the holy of holies. It contained the gold altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered with gold on all sides, in which there was a gold jar containing the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. The cherubim of glory were above it, overshadowing the mercy seat, and it is not possible to speak about these things in details right now. And with these things set up this way, the priests entered the first room repeatedly before performing their ministry. But the high priest alone enters the second room, and he does that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. This is a symbol for the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. They are physical regulations and only deal with food, drink, and various washings and pose until the time of restoration. Well, just in an overview right here, what do you see? All of this was outward physical stuff. Nothing was about changing the internal man or woman. Just as a real, if you really look at it really quickly, an overview, that's, that's what you see. And as we look at this chapter 9, we're going to look at a, a pretty detailed contrast between the Old Covenant Sanctuary and the New Covenant Heavenly Sanctuary where Jesus now ministers. And these first 10 verses are all about the Old Covenant Sanctuary, and that's probably all we're going to get through today. Um, we're going to look at um, five things that made that old tabernacle inferior. First of all, it was earthly. 
Uh, and you can go down to verse 11, which we just didn't read, but <clears throat> uh, but the Messiah has appeared high, high priest of the good things that have come in a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. So <laughs> it's, it's saying that the old earthly sanctuary was made by hands, so therefore it wasn't perfect. Um, and it was put up by man, and Martin referred to that back in 8.2. Uh, Moses called for the people to bring gifts to build this, and they brought so many material gifts that he actually had to put out, put out a, 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 a bulletin, if you will. <laughs> I don't know how they did it in those days, but a crier probably or something. But anyway, he had to put, put out a bulletin and say, Stop, we got more, we've got more than we need. <clears throat> and then if you read about Bezalel and Oholiab, I, I guess that's, or Holiab, I don't know how you pronounce it, but God gave those two men special wisdom and skill to do all the carvings and intricate work and how to put the temple together with all the things that God said to do. Um, and, <clears throat> and after the construction was completed, then the sanctuary is put in place and dedicated to God. You can go back into Exodus and Leviticus and read about all that. 35 through 40 in Exodus, those chapters, if you want something to read about, just go back and read about it. And then if you want to get into all the sacrifices and everything, read in Leviticus. A lot of it's in there. Uh, so even though the glory of God moved into the sanctuary, it was still an earthly building. And it was still constructed by human hands out of earthly materials. Have you ever wondered why God told them to build everything with all this gold and silver and bronze? And, um, well, I've wondered that. <laughs> and uh, it seems kind of a waste almost, doesn't it? Or it seems flamboyant and, and, and God, gaudy. But that, <clears throat> as I did some research, God did that for a reason. He did it for a reason. Those kinds of materials to the earthly man and women were priceless. And God should be to us priceless. The heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is right now is priceless. And that's the closest thing that man had here on earth to being priceless to give them an understanding of just how great and awesome and mighty God is. That made a whole lot of sense to me in asking in the questions I've asked in the past. <clears throat> Another thing about it is that this building built on earth, being man-made and here, such it, it was going to need a certain amount of repair. It, it had to have upkeep. How many of you own houses <laughs> or buildings? It takes upkeep, doesn't it? Uh, do you think that God has to be concerned with upkeep in the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is right now? No, I don't think so. Because it's perfect. It never has a foundation problem. It never has a roof problem. <laughs> the walls never crack. <laughs> uh, you know, just things like that. But it makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, the tabernacle was actually a tent that could be moved, taken down and moved periodically from place to place. And it belonged just to the nation of Israel. Not to the whole world. Jesus in his heavenly sanctuary belongs to everyone who chooses to believe and follow him as their Lord and Savior. And another thing about the uh, the earthly tabernacle was that it was just a copy of something much greater. Just like I just talked about the gold coverings and the gold inlays and solid gold objects. Uh, they were patterns made out of the close, the most uh, precious thing that man could find to imitate the things in heaven. Look down, right on down in chapter 9, verse 23. 
Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of these things in heaven to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than these. They were copies of the heavenly sanctuary. And what was the better sacrifice? Jesus. We talked about that. Jesus died one time, shed his blood one time, in this tabernacle, it had to be repeated over and over and over and over and over again. I don't know how many thousands of years that happened, but it went on for a long time. They kept looking forward to the Messiah as a foreshadowing. Do you have, did you get, was you able to make that? This is a real rough copy of, of the tabernacle. This outer room. And then there was a fence built all the way around it out of solid curtains that wasn't wasn't on this. This is just real rough. But uh, so there was like a courtyard that the actual Israelites could come into that. But all any of the Levites priests could come into this area. That's where they came every day to do the sacrifices and things. And it is really uh, simple. There's a table of showbread, the candlestick or lampstand. An incense altar. This is just denoting the curtain or the veil. And then in the, in the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant was the, was the uh, rod, Aaron's rod that budded. And there was a, a gold jar of manna and the stone tablets that God carved out for Moses to bring down off the mountain. And those were inside the covenant. And on the top of the, mercy, of the uh, Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat made out of solid gold. And there were two cherubim that looked over the, uh, the mercy seat. And their wings came out and they touched. One on each end and they touched. Um, I've got the dimensions written down here somewhere if I can find them. The Ark of the Covenant was... Uh, it was three feet nine inches long by two feet. I'm just trying to remember two feet and I hate to say it. I don't remember the inches on that. And I can't find my notes on it. Anyway, um, it's two feet six inches, I think, wide, and two. It was the same two feet six inches tall, and it was is where the high priest came in and sprinkled blood on the mercy seat. That would be in between the cherubim on the, on the Day of Atonement. Once a year. The first, he had to cleanse himself. Oh. The lampstand, it, it would go back to the outer <coughs> holy place. Um, each each piece of furniture had a whole lot of meanings. I'm just going to touch on a few today, but I'm not going to really get into it deeply. But the lampstand uh, was produced uh, was to produce light because there were no windows in that place. Uh, it just provided light for the priests to go about doing what they needed to do in there. The uh, and it was some, some symbolism there. Uh, the nation of Israel was supposed to be the light for the nation. You can go back in Isaiah 42 and read about that in 49. Uh, Jesus Christ is the light of the world. It's also kind of foreshadowing that. John 8, 12. <clears throat> and it also talks to us, the believers. We are to shine light in the world, aren't we? We're to shine light. We are to be a light in the world. Philippians 2, 14 and 15 talks about that. Then there's the table of showbread. Um, every Sabbath, uh, the priest would remove the old loaves and put fresh loaves on the table. The old loaves would be eaten, but they could only be eaten by the priest in that place. They couldn't take them out of the holy place. Uh, another term you might hear is the bread of presence. 
and it was supposed to remind them of the twelve tribes of God's uh, the twelve tribes that God's presence had sustained them in the wilderness, and it also would speak to us today of Jesus Christ. He's often referred to as the bread of life, given to the whole world. And then the golden altar, uh, the incense altar, uh, sometimes you might see a word called censer. Uh, some translations might say that, but it's for burning incense. But the golden altar, if you notice, is not in the Holy of Holies, but it was part of the Holy of Holies uh, activities. I, they, from what I can find out, they did burn incense in that every every day, but on the Day of Atonement, uh, it was used to burn incense and to take the fire into, they pulled the coals out of it, to make the fire in the Holy of Holies to burn the offerings in there and the incense in there. <clears throat> you had to burn incense before the mercy seat after you went into the veil. That's in Leviticus 16. So uh, everything had significant meaning and there's a, you could spend, I don't know how much time, I remember when I was a kid, my pastor uh, and our church did a study on the, on just the tabernacle, and I think we were in that for months, just going through all the real significant little intricacies. And uh, so uh, there's a whole lot more than what I'm going over. I'm just kind of trying to touch a few high points to give you an idea of how how much the priest had to know and follow become the high priest to come into the presence of God there on the mercy seat. Uh, and back in the holy place, every morning and evening, priests burn incense on the altar. Uh, David, if you look at in Psalms 141.2, David suggested that it's a prayer, a picture of prayer ascending to God. So that was a daily, two times a day. Uh, but it also should remind us that that Jesus in his heavenly sanctuary is interceding for us all the time. Uh, the incense altar is described, I'll give you scriptures there, I'm not going to go there all, for all this, but in Exodus 30 and Exodus 37. Uh, if you Also in Exodus 30 is a good place to look at at all the, about the uh, description of, of the incense and what it's used for. I just found it two feet three inches wide, two feet three <laughs> inches high. Oh, it was off three inches, sorry about that. But it was, it was three feet nine inches long, just shy of four feet, and two feet wide, three inches, and two feet three inches tall. I always imagined it to be bigger than that. Um, and but can you imagine this thing sitting there? I uh, mean, it had rings on it and poles that were all covered in gold. When they when they did move it, they had to carry it in a certain way. I mean, you can go into oh, there's all kinds of things about it. Just rem you remember the guy that touched it when it, <laughs> and he was struck dead because it didn't come uh, in the presence of God the way he's supposed to. But even though he was reaching out to touch it, to steady it so that it didn't fall, you still struck dead. David was very upset because he was afraid of David. Uh, so, you know, God, sometimes I think we take for granted just how, how critical it is to come before God in the right way. I'm choosing my words right with you. We want to get a warm, fuzzy feeling. <laughs> and that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's a whole lot more to it. If Jesus had not died on the cross and had a perfect life without sin and his blood was perfect to purify 
us from sin and make us righteous before a holy God, we would have to come before God on judgment day without the blood of Jesus. How many of us want to do that? I just described a situation where a man touched the covenant, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, and was struck dead because he didn't come before God rightly. God is a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. And that talk, and it talked about that all through the Old Testament of why these sacrifices took place. It was to appease the wrath of God because God does not like sin. He will not tolerate sin. But the blood of Jesus takes away sin. Once we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then we have the blood of Jesus there to take away our sin. But that's not a license to go on sinning and living any way we want to. We need to understand that. We can't just go, we shouldn't just go and live however we want to live and say, well, I got the blood of Jesus cover me. That's not biblical either. But I've heard a lot of people tell me that in the years that I've lived. <clears throat> we have the perfect Savior living in the perfect new covenant in this perfect sanctuary interceding for us, covering with us with his perfect blood without sin. Why would we not want to live for Christ? Why would we not want to love him and live our life the way he would want us to live? I know we're going to screw up. I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect, but we should live to be as high as perfect as we can. All of this stuff that I'm talking about was symbolism, leading to what I've just been describing to you about Jesus. But it wasn't spiritual reality. It was symbolism. That's what made the old covenant, the old tabernacle, the old system all inferior. So as I was describing to you, another thing that made this inferior or not perfect was it was inaccessible to the people. I just described to you. The only person that could go into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies one day a year was the high priest. I hope we don't ever have the idea that the Jewish people assembled in the temple or the tabernacle to worship. Because they did it. Only the priest and the people of the tribe of Levi could go into the holy place, and only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, and that's after a ritual cleansing ceremony, ceremonial cleansing to rid himself of, of sin in his own life. And then it was only temporary. It was just until the Messiah came. God's work for salvation for men and women were not complete until Christ the Messiah came. The outer court stood between all the people and the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was where the presence of God dwelt here on earth. Think about that. No man, woman, or child could come into the presence of God in the Old Testament covenant of the way of doing things because of the veil and the whole place. What do we have now? Every single one of us who profess Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior can come into the presence of God anytime we need to or want to through Jesus Christ. 
and only through Jesus Christ. We don't have to have a priest. We don't have to have sacrifices because the ultimate sacrifice has been done through Jesus Christ. So we don't have to go through all that. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that something that we ought to be rejoicing about? Amen. And lastly, they made this old system not so good. Was it? The ministry was external, not internal. No matter how many times incense and sacrifices were performed in the holy place, and no, how, no matter how many years that one day of atonement that the high priest went into the holy of holies and sacrificed, none of those things could actually change the heart or the conscience of the believers or the worshiper. All of these things that were going on, all these ceremonial things that were going on, in the temple had to do with ceremonial purity, not moral purity. They were carnal ordinances that pertained to the outer man, but they didn't change the inner man. Think about it. The priests did it all for everyone else. Sure, the people brought sacrifices. And I think some of them, they actually had some hands on like we were talking about earlier. But for the most part, it was the priests doing it. Now, I'm not saying that some people didn't change because they understood what really actually happened. What this was all about, the shedding of blood for the sin. But for the most part, it was ceremonial. Now God, God gave them specific ways, the priests, of how to approach him. He was very specific in how it had to be done. But we don't talk about that much today, do we? Sometimes I wonder if we don't get just a little bit lacks in how we approach God. How how humble we should be and how awesome God should be portrayed to be. Because he is. God told them exactly how to worship him in his old regulation. And that's why you see this referred to as earthly sanctuary. The tabernacle stood in the very center of the old covenant worship. The tabernacle was the place where Israel offered sacrifice, where the priest interceded on behalf of the people. What would we do if we had to have a priest intercede for us all the time? Israel was so focused on and so intense on what happened in and around that tabernacle. But the new covenant shifts our focus from the tabernacle of the Old Testament. We don't think about that much today, but right at this time, right after Jesus had been crucified and he'd been buried and, and he rose, uh, this, this letter is sometime after that, but not that long that it they don't remember all that happening because these people are wanting to go back to the old tabernacle ways. So he's saying we should shift our focus from the tabernacle. And under the new covenant, we don't have to go to the tabernacle. This one place where we can come and have the priest intercede for us. Uh, we can worship God. He's telling them you can worship God wherever. 
because the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ by our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, like it says in the scripture, I think it's in John 4, uh, worship him in spirit and truth. Hopefully I got that right chapter. Not in a, not in a tabernacle. <clears throat> Christ dwells in the midst. Christ dwells here today, doesn't he? Those of us who have Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, he's here today. He's everywhere that Jesus Christ is proclaimed and have believers everywhere over the whole world. Same Savior. It's hard to believe. It, it's hard to understand. In John 1, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the only way you could do it. The epicenter of the new covenant is not a place. It's a person. Jesus Christ. Before the new covenant, in the old covenant, it was a tabernacle. It was a place. Now it's not. It's in a person. Jesus Christ. brought to an end in those last few verses, I think 6 through 10, ended us, and us meaning, I'm meaning Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, ended having to have someone mediate for us to get access to God. I, I think we really, I really need to, to hammer that home, that we need to understand We can go to Christ anytime, any place, anywhere. We don't have to have anyone. It's good to have people that will get down and pray with you, but if we don't, if we are on our own, we can come to Christ anytime, any place. I just need to, I would ask you this week to just think about those things. How how much Christ did for us. What we have in place today. How much superior it is to the old covenant. It's, we're still human. But we have a perfect place for us to end eternity. Because Christ made the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice that never ever has to be repeated. I think that should lend us also to the fact that understanding that once we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he performed sacrifice once that's good forever. Our salvation is good forever. The Old Testament it had to be repeated and repeated and repeated. As soon as they sacrificed one animal for, for a sin, as soon as that was done, they sinned again. It had to be, they needed another sacrifice. We sin, but we still have the blood of Jesus taking away our sin. It does not have to be repeated. It's perfect. Jesus is the hope of the new covenant. Jesus is everything. He appeared as high priest. I read that in 9-11. Hebrews 9. Everything changed. But somebody alluded to earlier how, how, how much do people like to change? They have a hard time. These people are having a hard time. They had started out believing in Jesus and as they got persecuted and Hammered with all the stuff going on, they were wanting to go back the old way. We tend to do that, don't we? We all have those tendencies. Those tendencies of wanting to see before we believe. That's kind of human nature. 
I've often wondered why God made us that way, but <laughs> He did. Um, so as we close, think about think about this week. How great it is to just be able to just we can fall on our knees anywhere and access Jesus Christ and come to God's throne. We have access to the greatest high priest. We have access to the greatest covenant. We have access to the greatest sanctuary. This greatest sanctuary is going to be one of the places we can go to when we are done with this earthly life. And I pray if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you would want to know those words. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for that great sacrifice that you made for us. We thank you for your atoning blood, the perfect, sinless blood that makes each one of us righteous since that we just choose to follow you. We thank you for interceding for us, the Heavenly Father. We just thank you for how we can just come to you with anything at any time. We just give you praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen.